to make sure you can hear okay now. Mango Vine and my elven brothers and sisters, and today we are going into part two of how to make your own natural medicines. Last time we covered how to do um, tinctures, very simple tinctures, and uh, as well as capsules and where you can get your supplies and things of that nature. All right, so today we're actually going to still do another tincture, only this is a much more complex tincture. Uh, still very easy to do, but complex because it will require at least three different herbs. But this is a very valuable tincture. The tincture, we call it herbidine, all right, uh, because it's considered the herbal sister to betadine or like iodine. It's a major uh, anti-infective. In the 20 odd years that we have used this tincture on our patients and on ourselves, and on the other animal companions that we have. Uh, we have never, ever, ever seen uh, a wound become infected. It's, it's absolutely amazing. It actually, though we call it herbidine, it, it actually has a much older name called, the, and some of you might recognize this, the Jethro Kloss Herbal Liniment. Okay, it goes back probably 100 years or more, and it only uses three different uh, herbs. We'll get into that in just a minute. We're also going to go over how to make uh, salves. And so we're actually going to start on that now since we've already got it uh, prepared and we don't want it to cool too much. <clears throat> salves are important. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful skill to learn how to do that. And so I think it's important that we go ahead and make sure that be part of these the series of natural medicines. Also in the future, uh, please let us know what other workshops you'd like to have on, on the, this series of free workshops. This is for our students, but we're also trying to introduce uh, natural medicine to those who are not students as well. So give us ideas, things that you look for. We're looking at possibly doing one on natural first aid uh, for emergencies and otherwise. We'll be doing uh, herbal walks and so that you can see some of the things that grow here at our Elden Sanctuary. But, uh, but definitely looking at things like uh, natural first aids, how to take care of you and your family during emergencies, things of that nature. This is all information that's in the school in much more detail, but we'd like to give you a little introduction to it. Okay, and we're also going to be going over how to make a fomentation. A fomentation is simply uh, a cloth that is soaked in the, in the herbal formula and put onto a particular area of the body that is wounded or needs uh, some form of healing, whether it be wounds, rashes, burns, all those types of things. So we're going to show you how to do that. <clears throat> Okay, so let's get started with salves. This is my favorite salve of all. Actually, when I was before I went to medical school, I went to uh, a a natural uh, school for uh, herbal medicine where I became a master herbalist. It was the School of Natural Healing in Utah, and um, one of the school assignments. This was decades ago. One of the school assignments was to create our own formula and submit it to the school. And so I came up with something I called the green salve. Not very imaginative because it's green when it's done and you'll see that. But it is a wonderful salve across the board for so many different things that it can do. It's just made from three herbs. It's from comfrey and chickweed. When well, comfrey is some vitamin officinal for those that are interested in the herbal names, and Latin names, and who are into botany. And then plantain, this is plantago lancelata. Uh, I'll show you those. There's two kinds of plantain out there. They grow in almost everybody's yards. Plantago major and Plantago lancelata. We have both here in Northern California, though most of it is the lance leaf. We'll show you that. And the other one is chickweed, Stellaria media. Uh, these are all amazing herbs for healing wounds, rashes, skin issues, and uh, even psoriasis. It helps with eczema. It's, it's uh, and especially for burns and things of that nature. So we're going to go over that real quickly and show you how, how to make your own salve. So this is just one example of how to make a salve. There are, literally are probably thousands and thousands of formulas for salves. This one is very specific to wound care and skin care and things of that nature. All right, so let's kind of go ahead and get started on that, and um, I'll explain each one as we go. All right, so as I said, this one requires three different herbs. Okay, the first, this is one of our favorites is we actually got this out of our garden. We have a, a very, very, very large uh, comfrey uh, plant that grows in our garden. It's quite a number of years old. Uh, makes for very big leaves. This is just one of the smaller ones that grows there. So comfrey is Symphytum officinale. This 
plant is absolutely amazing for wound care of many types. We use it both internal and external. I know the FDA doesn't really like it being used internally, but uh, it was found that that was incorrect. It's extremely safe. All right, so Symphytum officinal comfrey, uh, one of the medical uh, classifications for this is uh, it is a cell proliferant. Cell proliferant, that means it regrows cells very, very quickly. Uh, for some of those that are going to the school, you'll be familiar with a case of ours, a patient who had had uh, a, a wound on his foot and let it fester for two months uh, because unbeknownst to me, he never told me that he had diabetes. And I don't think he realized it was out of control as it was, so he stepped on attack. Two months later, uh, the gangrene had started to come up his, literally crawl up his foot. And it was, by the time he got me to his house for a house call, it was already, um, he was probably about five days away from dying because it was, uh, had already, he'd already gone septic, his blood was poisoned, the wound was massively infected. I could literally look up into the wound. It was the worst I've ever treated. Anyway, so... The local hospital would have removed his foot. He refused to go, asked me to care for it. And we did, and we're blessed. We, in the school, you can actually see pictures where the foot regrew itself. All right. So um, we put him on a massive amount of formulas that included comfrey in it, both internal and external. And his foot literally regrew. We have seen this work very well. So that's comfrey is the first ingredient. Okay, and by the way, everything that you're going to be hearing here is pretty much equal parts. And if you remember from the last video, I talked about parts. Parts are often defined either by weight or by volume. We don't believe in by volume because some herbs like red raspberry leaf tea is extremely fluffy. And so it's hard to judge. So we go by the, the premise that all parts are in weight. So quarter ounces, ounces, pounds, whatever quantity you have to be making. So all of these are equal parts, one part of each. So that's equal weight of each. So if you use one ounce of comfrey, you then will go on to one ounce of plantain. Okay, plantain, like I said, isn't just about everybody's garden or yard. Uh, this is, uh, what, let's still plant. Okay, so, there we go. Okay, so lance, this is plantago lancelata, just plain old plantain. And you probably have seen these flowers, you know, throughout your childhood and on. So these, this is plantain. Plantain is another wonderful herb. The reason I included it is it is also like a cell proliferant, but it binds wounds together very, very quickly. For, and it also draws infection out. Many, many, many decades ago, I was in a garden and unbeknownst to me, I wasn't doing what I needed to be doing and I got bit by a spider. All right, okay, I knew what to do or I thought I did. And so I did something extremely wrong. And what I did was I took fresh garlic, okay, pasted it and put it on the wound. All right, thinking, oh yeah, that'll protect me. Okay, garlic is one of those amazing, amazing herbs. Like I said, it's called Russian penicillin. It is a medical fact that three to five fresh cloves of garlic is the equivalent to an adult dose of penicillin. Only it doesn't destroy your microflora like penicillin does. Well, garlic's great going in, <clears throat> and it doesn't cause any problems internally, but it should never be put on the skin, fresh garlic paste. It can be in an oil, but not as a paste, because it, by the time I woke up the next morning, it had completely burned my skin, and now there was an infection there. Again, this was many, many, many years ago. All right, so I went and did what I should have done in the first place, and I went outside, found some plantain, mashed it all up, and made what's called a poultice, where you just get it in water, heat it up, mash it all up, don't boil it, but get it nice and hot and basically end up with this mush of plant material. And I put that, you know, this this uh, very, very herb here, plantain, that's all I use. And then basically placed it on the wound and then covered it up with saran wrap and left it on there. By the next morning, I had pulled it off and all the infection had been pulled out and the wound was already beginning to seal just overnight. So it's incredible. So plantain is one of my favorites. That's why I included it in the green salve. And the final herb is chickweed. All right, Stellaria media. It grows a lot in the eastern part of the United States, not so much over here in California. Okay, it is extremely soothing and healing, very soothing for the skin, great for rashes and just soothing. So we included that. So what you're going to be hearing is basically one part, or in this case, we're just small, one part of comfrey, 
one part of plantain, and one part of chickweed. All right, so that's all we're gonna do. So this is actually very easy. We'll go through this pretty quickly. All right, so you basically can take the comfrey, in this case, and we have a little scale so that we can measure it, just to make sure that we're approximately, this really isn't rocket science, so we don't have to be too exact with a salve, though for the purposes of teaching you brand new, we will. So you can see I just rip it, break it, bruise it, put it in there, and then basically get it to where it's about the weight that I want, all right? And put it, in, and you can have much bigger uh, pans, but that's what we're doing. And the same with the comfrey. Again, this doesn't have to be rocket science. Break the comfrey up and the plantain. Again, these aren't equal parts, but I'm just trying to show you, give you some idea of how to do this, and then put some chickweed in it. Okay, again, very simple stuff. All right, then you take that, and we always prefer, okay, it doesn't have to be this brand, but we prefer the extra virgin cold pressed uh, organic olive oil. All right, it's just, olive oil is the queen or king, however you want to look at it, of all oils. Uh, from a doctor's point of view and from a nutritionist's point of view, we only accept three oils with ourselves or with our patients. And olive oil is number one, the best oil. I know there's a lot of doctors running around right now going, oh, you shouldn't have any oils in your diet, and that is not correct. Yeah, there are some very bad oils out there, but there are some oils that if you get them correctly, they're amazing for, for, uh, for your health. All right, and so olive oil is number one. And number two and number three, just for your information, they kind of compete with each other. Uh, as for second and third place is avocado um, and um, coconut oil. Those are the three oils that we prefer. Now, wheat germ oil is good when we use it for certain things, but those are the top three oils that are the best. And olive oil is number one. I have seen miracles occur using olive oil both externally and internally as well. Okay, so again, this is not rocket science. It's very easy. We basically take our pan with the herbs in it, all right, and we basically pour the oil in it until it's covered up, all right. Okay, stir it all up, okay. Very, very simple. The herbs are all mixed in. As you can see, we're just pretty much getting them all soaked into the oil, okay. Nice and soaked in there. All right, next step, and for sake of time, we're not going to actually go through every single second of doing this, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what it takes. So in here, we have the olive oil. We have all three plants. We've mixed it to where they're nice and soaked together. They're covered with, just barely covered, but they're covered with the olive oil. Okay. And at this point, we take this and we put it under the burner. Okay. Okay. And turn it down low. You want it down quite, you want it down low because you don't want to burn the oil, you don't want to burn the pan, the, the plants or anything in there. So you keep it down low, make sure, make sure that while you're doing this, that you keep this stirred, you know, don't leave it for more than probably 30 seconds at a time. And just kind of stir it around, okay? And you're gonna do that probably for as much as five or 10 minutes. That's really all it takes when it's up to full heat, probably about five, 10 minutes at that point. Let it sit there. Okay, and that's going to go on again. Once it's up to full heat, you're gonna, you know, it's nice and simmering low, not boiling, at the lowest setting, like you can see here. All right, again, five ten minutes. That's really all it takes. Okay, and then once we're done with that, turn the burner off. Okay, now this is not done yet. Okay, you could in theory use this, but I personally would not. My wife and I like to let it basically steep for probably about an hour, two hours. Just let it, because it's nice and hot. You can, you can already smell it, uh, that the herbs are hot. They're already seeping into the oil. And let that sit probably for about an hour or two to, to do that. And let them soak into the oil. And then at that point, um, should be. Okay. All right, we're gonna go ahead and then get a strainer. So let's just pretend it's been soaking for about two, three hours. And we're gonna take it and we're going to pour that into another container. All right, and you just gonna strain it through. Okay, we're almost done. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So here is the oil. 
And what we basically like to do is kind of clean that out because we're going to reuse this pan. Okay. Now you can already see that oil is already very dark. For what little we've done, it's already a very dark oil. And you're going to take that oil, pour it back into the pan. Now that it's been strained, you're going to take it and you're going to put it back on the burner. Okay. This is the part that <clears throat> it's easy, but it takes a little bit of practice. And this is when you start using the beeswax. Okay, beeswax, that's the last ingredient. So what you have to make a very effective wound and skin and rash type salve uses only just a few things. It's comfrey, and these are all equal parts. Comfrey, plantain, and chickweed. Use enough olive oil to cover it, let it soak for a while after it's come to heat and put it aside and let it soak for a couple hours. And the last ingredient is beeswax because we want it to now become a salve so that it will not just run off of us as an oil, we want it to be a thick salve. Okay, and at that point, we're not going to run through all this, but just to give you kind of an example of how it works, you basically <laughs> turn the oil back on. All right, and as the oil is heating, okay, you'll, you'll take just a, this is again a part that takes some practice. All right, is you take the beeswax, all right, okay, and then you're, until you get used to how to do this, you want to do a little at a time, and we're actually going to show you how to tell when you've done the right amount. So it's easy to add. It's extremely difficult to take away. So this is a slow process. So you take just a little bit of beeswax. After it's come back up to heat, and now it's, now it's nice and hot, and you add the beeswax to it, and you stir it until the beeswax is melted. Okay, give that just a couple minutes. Okay, and then we use an old-fashioned trick that uh, we learned from your mom, didn't we, Dan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is actually an old trick in the uh, south, uh, southern, back in Alabama, uh, Peggy's family. This is a trick to know when you've got enough beeswax in there. Okay. And uh, we're going to show you the finished product, and this is what it looks like. So all said and done, this is what it looks like when everything's through. And you can take, so the trick is, while it's going on and you're slowly adding beeswax, with each time you add the beeswax, you want to test it after the wax is melted. And you can take, so this one was just heated. You take a little bit of it, and you put it in water. Immediately put it in the water here. Okay, now this is already already turned uh, to like a salve. It cools immediately. Okay, and see, that is a nice salve. So what happens is, and there you can see in the spoon, it's already frozen, so to speak. It is a nice salve. I can, I can still use, move it around. Okay, but, so tricks. You keep adding it until it becomes a salve because at first you're gonna keep adding the wax to the oil and you're gonna drop it in the little drop of it into the water. And it's not going to harden at all. It's just going to be oil and water. Eventually, you're going to add enough wax to, to the salve oil that sooner or later, then when you put it in there, it's going to happen just what we have here. It's going to become a nice waxy salve. Okay. <clears throat> the problem is, is if you don't take your time, if you don't do a little bit at a time, what you're going to end up with is a rock hard salve. You're going to put it in the water here and it's going to go, just going to become a rock. Obviously, that's not going to work well because it's not going to uh, melt at room temperature very nicely. This water is room temperature. I just put the finished product, I dip some in there, and it turned to a salve without being too hard. So that's what it will be like at room temperature. But if you add your wax too quickly without testing it, period, you know with each little bit that you do. <clears throat> and again, you'll get used to this. But if you don't do that and you add too much at one time, then when you put the, uh, the oil into here to test it, it's going to become a rock. And that's what it will be because if the water is room temperature, that's what the sap will be at room temperature. So you don't want that to happen. Again, little practice, you'll get there and uh, you'll end up with this nice, oily, greasy sap that uh, works wonderful. So. This is it in its final form. Okay, so we're kind of stepping ahead here in time. Here is the final. It's a beautiful, 
beautiful deep deep green it's so green it almost is a brown or black but that is the finished product of it okay at this point you can take it and it just simply you we have these containers with the school and with the uh, clinic store um, you can get them other places as well but we have them and the big pour it in okay and it's nice and pretty. Let's see if you can see that. Okay. And then you take it, cap it, and immediately, immediately put it in the fridge. Okay. Because if you don't, okay, if you don't immediately start to cool it, then it will separate. You know, the different components may separate and you'll get these layers. So if you immediately put it in the fridge, it'll cool evenly. And here's the finished product after it's already been through the fridge. All right, we have little labels that we put on them. You can do the same. They're available at the store in the school if you want. And here is a beautiful, beautiful salve. All right, just, just stunning. Nice and green color. Um, there we go. Nice green color. Uh, wonderful salve. Again, there's some, it, it heals We've noticed just, it can heal just about anything with wounds. There is a and rashes uh, and so forth. There is a caveat. There is a warning when you use it. And this is a good kind of warning, but it is a warning nonetheless. Because this salve is so effective, because it works so well, we do not recommend that you immediately put it on an open wound that's more than a scrape or a, you know an abrasion. If it's an open wound, there has actually been a cut into the wound and it's gone really, you know, a little bit deeper into it. We don't recommend you use this the very first day because it is so effective at sealing and it can seal within hours a wound. Okay, if you put that on an open wound and you have not taken enough care to wash that wound thoroughly, and a lot of people don't, then what can happen is it can seal the dirt and infection in there and course, like I said, then you can become infected with it. So our recommendation is for wound care, especially of this type, and if you're not going to go to a doctor or to a hospital or a clinic and you insist on treating it yourself, the salve is to be used about 24 hours after. Now, again, rashes, abrasions, bruises, you know, where you've been scraped, you know, road rash, <laughs> things of that nature, that's okay. After you've cleaned it really well and you can put the salve, we've noticed for others that it works very well just putting it straight on it. But an open wound, okay, you don't want to use it for at least 24 hours. So what do you do for those 24 hours while you're waiting to be able to use your wonderful miracle green salve? Okay, you would first, you would go to what we're about to make here, and that is Herbidine, which is again, the herbal sister to Betadine. And I would use that first for about 24 hours, applying it just like you would iodine or betadine. Apply it to the wound. It will sting, but it works great. We've never seen anyone become infected after having used this. And then after about 24 hours, we would still keep putting the uh, herbidine on it. Okay, but then we would also put the green sap over the application of the herbidine. And that way it heals normally. Okay, so <clears throat> a couple other uses. These are weird uses that you can use. For a green salve, we had a patient many, many years ago. She loved the uh, green salve. I mean, she used it for everything, cuts and scrapes and bruises and wounds and you name it. Well, she surprised us one time with an email about another use that she ended up finding for it. <laughs> and that was to, uh, the story is, is that uh, she worked in these cubicles, you know, this office area, and you know, everyone had their own cubicles. Well, her cubicle was obviously just in sight of the bathroom, okay, where she could see the doors of the bathroom. And one of her cubicle mates came out of the bathroom one day, and he was kind of walking a little straddled, a little uncomfortable. And she looked at him and said, Mike, what is the problem? And I guess their relationship was good enough where he told her, uh, hemorrhoids, bad, hurting very, very bad. She said, oh, hold on. <laughs> okay, now it's best to keep the salve refrigerated. All right, it can last a year or more having it refrigerated, you know, at full potency. But you can carry it with you. It's just that it will be soft. And so you want to make sure that the cap is tight and it won't last as long if you don't keep it refrigerated you know, as far as potency is concerned. All right. Well, she always carried hers in her purse. And so when he told her what her situation, his situation was, she went, oh, try this. 
And she reached in and grabbed the salve and handed it to him. Okay. She said, use it for your hemorrhoids too. And uh, okay, me personally, I would have given him a sample. I wouldn't have given him my whole jar. Well, he twiddles back into the uh, bathroom. He's in there probably about five, 10 minutes. And he comes out. He's not walking straddled. He's feeling great. He hands her back the salve. Okay. Hands her back the salve and said, that stuff was amazing. I'm, I feel much better now. All right. Well, that was a, a great introduction to, for me, that this salve can be used even for hemorrhoids. So let's go forward about another 10, 15 years, and probably about 10 years or more. And I had a couple of patients come into the clinic, and they both, this is husband and wife, they had a multitude of other issues, but something in common between the two of them was they both had hemorrhoids. And his, and so she was talking to me about hers, and I said, well, okay, well, I can tell you, I know historically this green salve has worked wonderfully on hemorrhoids. And so he pipes in, he goes, really? And I said, yes, uh, we've seen great, uh, great success with it. Okay, so he said, I'm scheduled for a hemorrhoidectomy in nine days. That means they're going to snip the hemorrhoids off. And there can be so many other issues that can go with that. Infections, using your uh, ability to hold a bowel movement and not leak. It goes on and on and on. But his hemorrhoids were so bad, they were actually going to surgically remove them in nine days. And so he said, would that work? And I went, I don't know if it's going to work in nine days. But like Dr. Christopher used to say, it's not going to hurt to try. So he takes the salve home, remember, nine days. On day four of these nine days, he calls the clinic and he says, I just want to let you know, the salve works so amazingly well that on day three, I called the surgeon and canceled the surgery. He did not have to have the hemorrhoidectomy so at that time. So it was a great story of many of the hidden values that we have behind natural medications, that being one of those. Okay, so that's the, the salve, green salve. All right, let's move on now to a, another formula, and this one is Herbidine. This, as far as tinctures are concerned, is my favorite of all. And as I told you before, its original name was the Jethro Kloss Herbal Ointment, and this is called an, an overall all-purpose liniment that can be used for sprains, strains, bruises, insect bites. It's an effective antiseptic that has often been called the herbal sister to Betadine. It stings, but it works. So it stings just like, and you'll find out why in just a minute. It stings just like iodine does, but that's okay because that's it's it's working. It can be applied to canker sores, all right, inside the mouth to speedily dry them up, and it's also useful for treating poison ivy, poison oak, and such. On the eastern part of the United States, they have a lot of poison ivy. Over here in the western part of the United States, we have a lot of poison oak. This formula, like I said, we call it uh, herbidine. All right, and uh, we always keep it in our own personal med medicine kit. And I have to say thousands of patients over the years have used this, they keep it in their house. The good news is <clears throat> it's made from alcohol. Okay, and you're gonna see that here in just a minute how we make it. Alcohol tinctures, as I think I told you in the original part one of this, they're rated to last uh, 10, 15 years, but I have seen them never, never go bad ever, as long as they're kept in a cool, dark place, you know, like a medicine kit or in your purse, hopefully, or, you know, somewhere where it's not, don't leave it in the car, things of that nature. It does not have to be kept in the fridge like a salve does. <clears throat> as I told you in the original video, uh, I know of this individual who collects medieval tinctures. Again, that's tinctures from like 13, 1400s. Okay. To this day, they're as good as the day they were laid out back in the 13, 1400s. That's how long alcohol-based tinctures can last. All right, and we told you the value last part one of, of why you would use an alcohol over or other types of medias, like uh, mediums like water or things of that nature. Okay, so this is one of those that works well. We love, <laughs> not for drinking, but we love the blue label Smirnoff because this is 100 proof. That means it is 50% water, 50% alcohol. So it's the best medium media, medium for, uh, most herbs, some herbs require water to extract the medical constituents, some require alcohol. This is kind of the best of both worlds. All right, and this one works well. So what this is going to use is it's going to have uh, alcohol, and we're going to be using golden seal. Golden seal is unfortunately very, very expensive. Uh, you can get it through us, and we can help you get it less expensive, but it is what it is. Golden seal is a very expensive uh, herb out there. So it uses uh, golden seal. 
and it uses mer, and it uses cayenne. That's, it. That's all it uses. Okay. <clears throat> why do we use these three herbs in this, and why did the original one, Jethro Kloss, use them? Golden seal is a probably the most that we've ever seen, the most powerful antiviral that we've ever dealt with. It is an antibacterial, anti-infective overall, but it shines as an antiviral. So any viral issues, we've seen patients use it for, whether it's influenza A, others have even used it for the COVID virus, things of that nature, because it is an antiviral. I'm not saying on here that officially cures COVID, I'm saying people have used it for working with the COVID virus. Okay, influenza, all those other types of things. And that's why this works on canker sores. Canker sores are a type of herpes virus. So it works very well on that. It kills the viruses on contact. It's been absolutely amazing using it. Okay, Mer is also a very strong anti-infective as well. Uh, we love using Mer uh, because it, it does such a good job as anti-infective killing both bacteria and especially viruses. And then cayenne. We have cayenne in here, hence the reason it stings. But cayenne is extremely important. We have it in a smaller dosage in here. We'll show you that in a moment. Cayenne, the medical term for it is a rubefacient. A rubefacient means, where, and we talked about this in the other video, wherever it touches, either internal or external, all right, it, rubefacient means that it brings blood to the region. So along with that, it does get very hot because blood gets to that region, and it uh, brings along with it nutrients, and oxygen, which causes wounds and such to heal faster. As we told you, this is excellent cayenne. is excellent for stopping bleeding, both internal and external. Great for strokes, heart attacks, and such. Okay, so because it is such an antiviral, I have a wonderful story to tell about what we did uh, with this. And I, I may have mentioned it in the first video, and that was about my father-in-law, Virgil. Okay, he had the worst case of shingles. And some of you out there may not be personally associated with shingles, but maybe you've known people who are older who get it because shingles is nothing more than chickenpox that simply went to sleep, usually goes to sleep in someone's spine, goes to sleep for decades and decades, waiting for either in a, a compromised immune system due to diet, exercise, lack of exercise, poor health otherwise, um, trauma, surgery, like an accident, car accidents, things of nature, anything for the elderly that causes their body to go into some kind of shock uh, reaction, uh, stress reaction, and if they already have a suppressed immune system that makes it worse, and the shingles reawakens, the chickenpox reawakens shingles because it then goes through and it attacks the nerves. All right, shingles is, can be extremely painful. Some of you may be very well, well aware of this. All right, well, the general consensus medically is that if you don't do anything for it, it generally can resolve itself within 30 days. So that's 30 miserable days, and so I don't recommend doing that. But on the norm, it can resolve itself within 30 days. Not in the case of my father-in-law. My father-in-law, it was so bad, and he hadn't told us about it. We were about 25, 30 minutes away from where we lived. And finally, one day, he called us, and he said, I've had shingles for six weeks, pretty much from the top of his head throughout his body. He's just this huge shingles rash, and it was extremely painful. He'd had it for six weeks, and his other doctor had told him that, uh, Virgil, there's nothing I can do for this. Fortunately, he was a young doctor. He knew about country folk, and he was a little bit more open-minded. And he said, Virgil, if you've got any old family remedies, I really recommend that you try them. So my father-in-law called us and asked for help, and I took a lot for him to do that. And so we immediately headed out, grabbed our medical bag, and we only took two things with us. That's all we took to help him with his shingles. One was the herbidine, okay? And the other was golden seal. So taking it as a capsule, okay, internally. So we were going to fight this virus, the shingles from the internal and external. We got there, and he was miserable. He's in what was called Papa's chair. That's where he sat. In the South, a lot of people like to wear their ball caps. He was in such pain and discomfort, he wasn't even wearing his ball cap because of all of the shingles rashes. And he was sitting in his chair like this, his head in his hands, and again, a month and a half of his torments. I can understand why he was the way he was. Okay, all we did was we got there, I examined him, and then we went, okay. Multiple times a day, take the herbidine, 
put it on to cotton balls and just scrub and get it, dab it all over the rashes. We gave them a lot of herbidine, obviously, and just do that multiple times a day. When you first put it on there, it will sting. But the blessing is, is that right after the sting is gone, the burning and itching are gone. Now, it'll come back later, and that's why you reapply. But immediately within seconds, the burning of the shingles disappears right after the burning of the herbidine. That's his thing. Disappears. So we had him do that multiple times a day, just scrub and wash all of the uh, the, the shingles, the rashes, sores with herbidine. And then we told him to take the golden seal in capsules, which you learned last time how to make. It's a single herb. Just you know, We told you how to do that. And we told him to take that about three capsules three times a day or three capsules four times a day. So fight internal and external. Remember, he'd had this for six weeks. By the time he started using it that day, he called us the next morning and he said, I just want to let you know that uh, I'm feeling better. Uh, and within a week, it was gone. All right. So something that had last for six weeks was taken care of with nothing more than topical applications of herbidine and taking golden seal internally. So this is why golden seal is added to this particular formula. All right. So again, everything's in parts. Remember, parts are in weight. So let's do that real quickly. Get your little handy dandy little scales out and always make sure that you zero it out when you're ready. Okay, so let's see if we can do this here real quickly. Okay, yeah, we can do it in here. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and do it exactly. So I'm gonna go ahead and post online the formula for this in the description. I'll get that posted later on today. But for those that want to, you can read the rewatch this or go ahead and write it down now. This is the formula for the herbidine. Again, for infections, for wounds, for making sure wounds don't get infected, for shingles, for insect bites, put it immediately on the insect bite. It's amazing how quickly it heals. Um, use it like betadine and herbidine uh, and, uh, and iodine. Works wonderful. Uh, also, I mentioned it here in reading this, but I just want to let you know I'm a great case for this. Many, 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 many years ago, I used to be very allergic to poison oak, IV poison oak. And this is amazing for poison, I, poison IV oak sumac because it destroys the oil that it comes off the plant. And uh, uh, my wife and I, we were in Alabama, so that was poison ivy. And we had gone up on this mountain, this park that was at the top of a mountain that you could basically jog or walk around this lake. After we were done, we sat down in the new mowed grass, not realizing because it was new mowed, so we didn't see it. They had mowed over poison ivy. Now, my wife wasn't susceptible to it, but I was. We sat down and we enjoyed the, the afternoon sitting there just looking over the lake after we had run around the lake. We went home and after a little while later, my legs started itching and they started itching and started itching and really bad. And we checked it and on my thighs, just these huge, on both thighs, this huge rash had welted up. And uh, it was incredible. And I knew how I was back then, umpteen years ago. If I just touched and touched somewhere else, I was doomed. And so this was maddening. So what we did was my wife took the herbidine and just bathed, bathed the wound, the, uh, the, the welts, just soaked it with the herbidine. Then we did one other thing. So this is kind of a neat thing to do because I'm going to talk to you about fomentation. So you can kind of learn the whole thing today. She soaked, just painted it with the herbidine. And then we took oak bark, pure oak bark powder, and we made a fomentation out of it, which you'll do here in a little bit, where you soak the cloth. So over the herbidine, she took the oak bark fomentation while it was nice and hot, but not scalding, and wrapped it around both of my thighs and then did the saran wrap and paper and the, and the towels to keep it all the heat in there. She did that and I was laying on the living room floor letting it seek in. The itching was maddening and within minutes the itching because the reason for oak bark is because it's an astringent really tightens the, the, the skin up. Within minutes the itching started to diminish and all of a sudden I felt this heat because cayenne started bringing blood to the region and all of a sudden those two areas just became very, very hot, not uncomfortable. It felt amazing. It felt like it was just burning the poison ivy away. And you could literally take your hand and put it over the towel and you could feel the heat radiating off of me. 
we left it on there all night. When we woke up the next morning, took them off, and the welts, the welts were gone, weren't they? Yeah. The welts were completely gone. We did one more application after that just to be on the safe side, but the welts were gone. Just one night of doing this. So Herbidine, absolutely amazing. Again, insect bites, whether those are spider bites or uh, especially like mosquitoes, bee stings, things of that nature. So here we go. This is extremely easy to make. And we'll show you the finished product. Okay. The recipe or formula for this is, ready? Okay. Remember, these are parts, and so, but we'll make this easier for you. It's to make this formula, and then if you want to make double, you double it, triple it, so forth. Two ounces of powdered myrrh, okay? Two ounces of the powdered myrrh, okay? We have all these at the store in the school. It's up to you. But two ounces of powdered myrrh. One ounce, okay, of powdered golden seal. And a half an ounce, see how we're going down here, and a half an ounce of cayenne. All right, cayenne, don't let people fool you about cayenne. We do prefer organic or well-crafted. Cayenne is part of the capsicum family. That includes cayenne, includes habaneros, includes uh, jalapenos. They're all measured in heat units. That's actually very important to know. The average cayenne, like in the bag here, and like what you would buy usually in the grocery store, uh, is about 40,000 heat units. Okay, that sounds like a lot, and that's why it's so spicy when you eat it. But so if cayenne is 40,000, and jalapenos are 90,000, and habaneros are 200,000, all right? So it feels you're like in the fire of Hades when you're eating some of these. But here's the blessing with cayenne, and this is a medical fact. Whereas, you know, you get uh, garlic on your skin, it can burn. Okay, cayenne, whether it's internal or external, even if you feel like you're on fire, cayenne causes zero tissue damage. It does not damage the tissues. And so it, even though your stomach may be ablaze, it's actually not causing any damage. It's actually healing. Okay, but again, we only use about a half an ounce. Okay, so... Um, I'm not actually going to do this. We kind of, we did a little bit of this last time. Just going to show you. So we have normally what you would have is you'd have your basics and vodka. Just mix it all together. So do your two ounces and put it in a bowl, and then take your one ounce of golden seal, put it in the same bowl, mix it around, and then finally take your half an ounce of powder cayenne, mix it in a bowl. That's all. And what you end up with is something that looks like this. All right, so this is Herbidine, all done. Jethro Claus's liniment, all done. It's, it's all set up and done. So what do we do now? Okay, okay. So we have our little bottle here, okay? And this is very important. We talked about this last time. Again, it's not rocket science, but I would like you to at least try to get as close as you can until you become used to doing this. All tinctures, unless it's specifically said otherwise, through history, through the formulas and the dissertations on them, all are basically a four to one. Okay? So that's four ounces of the liquid to one ounce of the powder. Four to one. Okay, so let's do that. If we're going to get, say, we're going to do one ounce of the powder. Okay, so let's just kind of scoop that out. We're going to do this until we get to it. Okay. So here's one ounce of the powder, and we're going to put it in our little jar here. Obviously, if you want more, double, triple, and so forth. So if you double that, it would be two ounces to eight ounces. Okay, so four to one. Okay, so we've got, in this case, one ounce of powder. So we know that that, therefore, means four times the amount of powder. So it's going to be four ounces of vodka. And again, this isn't brain surgery. Some things are very, very fluffy, so you may have to add more. You definitely want to make sure you've covered it with a little bit more. All right, and so this one will measure in ounces. Okay, so here goes our vodka. Okay, and that is close enough. Take that. So here's our completed Urbanine. Take the vodka, put it in there. As you can see, it looks pretty good. I tend to go just a little bit more. Again, I like it a little bit over it. Not a whole lot. Okay, just make sure it's over it a little bit. <clears throat> Cover it. Okay, shake it up. 
There we go. All right, now, always make sure, because it takes a minimum of two weeks to make a tincture. They can be done quicker for emergencies. We tend to go, well, let's make it ahead of time so we don't have to worry about that. But in emergencies, I've seen them work within three days. All right, but the preference is to go two weeks. So after we put that in there, <clears throat> we go ahead and mark the date, the, <clears throat> the today's date, <clears throat> and then we put it aside, usually in the kitchen because that's where you're in every day, not directly in the sun, somewhere in the shade. Okay, so that what you'll do is two or three times a day, you know, when you when you walk by, you look at it and go, ah, shake it some more, shake it really good, all right, because you want to have it shaken at least once every day, twice or more is even better. Okay, and then set aside, that's it. That's all there is to it. After about two weeks, you strain it through some cheesecloth or through an old-fashioned baby diaper, and you have the finished product, which is Herbidine. We always, always, always keep a bottle of this. Those two formulas that I just told you about, Herbidine and Green Sab, they're both very inexpensive to make. <clears throat> Again, Golden Seal's a little expensive. We can help you out with that a little bit. But overall, Golden Seal uh, is still worth the price. Okay, so you have Green Sab, you have Herbidine, you have a large amount of the medications when used for most wound care that you have. Obviously, there's things that you would have to see a professional about, but most wound care, these will take care of it. Again, one last time, the caveat is, make sure that if it is an open wound and not just an abrasion or a rash, but if it's a good open wound, green salve does not get used for 24 hours. It will seal it too fast. So uh -huh. if you herbidine over it you know, multiple times a day after 24 hours, you still keep using the herbidine, Okay, but then over the Herbidine, you put the green salve and put a bandage on it and change that bandage every day. And we, like I said, we've seen miracles even all the way down to hemorrhoids. Okay, so those two formulas, learn to make those. They're very simple. And uh, once you make the Herbidine, it'll last. It, it, it'll last forever as long as you keep it in a cool, dark place. Green salve, you probably have to remake it. If you keep it in the fridge, you can remake it every year. Okay, it will still be good after a year, but it won't be as potent as it was. And so generally we recommend salves. You know, some people say six months. We say if you keep it in the fridge, you can just remake it every year. All right. So those are those. That's how easy it is to make um, all of those. So one last thing I want to go over. And then if you have any questions, I'd like to have a little question and answer period for you. Last thing we want to do is how to make a fomentation. Okay, and again, what is a fomentation? A fomentation is nothing more than the um, herb that has been heated in water. So it's, it's a tea is what you're making, either a tea or a decoction. Decoction is a very strong concentrated tea, but a tea, basically. And in this case, we have uh, one of our favorites. Okay, where did we put the, where'd you put, do you know? Oh, here we go. Yes, oh yes, my wife wanted to make sure that it was in the school cup. <laughs> All right, so here in this case, we have uh, some herbal tea, and we pour it into uh, a container that we'll be able to get a cloth into. Normally, this is heated, all right, but in this case, uh, we're just trying to demonstrate it. So I'm going to bring in my wife so that she can demo how we use a fomentation. Okay, why would you use a fomentation? A fomentation would be an excellent way of getting... Um, a, a concentrated form of the medication in, in tea form or decoction and a wet cloth applied directly over the area, for example, rashes and, and even wounds. Remember like what I did with the being bitten by the spider and then wrap it up there so that it keeps the liquid medication right on the wound. Okay, so she's gonna come in. I'm gonna show you how to do this. Okay, so this is my wife, Peggy, Peggy the world. <laughs> or some kind of wound, that type of thing, you know, not an open wound, obviously, but you could. Okay, we prefer old fashioned white cotton cloth baby diapers. We like them white because white means no dye. And obviously we don't want dyes against little baby's bottoms. We don't want dyes against uh, anyone else's skin. So white cotton cloth. You can use uh, an old t-shirt if it's white and cotton and uh, has not been use for anything else other than wearing, I guess. But we prefer the old-fashioned diapers. They're getting hard to find, but where can you get them now? 
Amazon. Oh, great, Amazon. Used to be you could buy them in most stores and not not so much anymore. Can you still get them at Walmart? Mm -mm. Wow. They oh. cut all diapers out except for throwaways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, okay. So you take the cloth and you soak it really well in whatever tea you're using. Okay. If anybody's curious, this is red raspberry leaf tea. It is actually good for internally, but we also like it for uh, wonderful for the eyes, for like conjunctivitis, things of that nature, and also soothing for wounds and such. Okay. So you want it wet, but not too soaked and where, you know, where it'll just run all over everything. Okay. So we take that and we make sure we got, okay. And we place it over the wound or over the issue that we're dealing with. Okay. And we try to wrap that up pretty good. Okay. If you'll hold that. Okay. Okay. And saran wrap. Okay. We normally don't care for saran wrap because it's such a waste and rough on the environment. But for things like this, it works very well. So we wrap it with a saran wrap. I'm not doing a super great job That's here. Okay. <laughs> okay, so wrap it up really well. What this does is it holds the water and helps hold the heat in, the tea in. And after that, we're actually almost done. You then take a towel of some type and wrap the towel around it to help also keep the moisture in there as well as the heat. You can put a heating pad on it or you can just leave it like this. And in most cases, we leave a fomentation on uh, anywhere from 20 minutes up to an hour, depending on the circumstances. This is exactly what we did for, for my particular, for my poison oak, poison ivy, actually. So we took the herbidine, which you just learned how to make, painted it all over it. <clears throat> then, in that case, we made a very strong tea out of the oak bark, all right? And while it was still hot but not scalding, we then took the cotton cloth, soaked it in it, and in this case, wrapped it on my thighs, wrapped that up with saran wrap, put the towel on it, and, and within minutes, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Within minutes, I had relief. So there you go. Thank you, Peggy. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so... You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so three very easy things to do. We've learned how to make fomentations to be placed onto wounds, skin, irritations, rashes, things of that nature, uh, help pull infection out depending on the type of herb you use. You can learn all of these in the uh, Elven Herbalist School course with Lemme and Gomor if you choose to. Uh, there's also other great things on the web you can look at. So you learn about fomentations, you learn how to make a more complicated tincture. Again, if you don't ever learn how to make any other tincture, this tincture we have seen save so many lives and help alleviate so much discomfort and pain. All right. And then finally, salves, the green salve. If you never learn how to make another salve, that's one of the best salves that you can do. I've seen it pull infections out. I've seen it seal wounds up. I've seen it save, again, whole feet you know, and hands and appendages. I've seen it work well, even with, like I said, gangrene. I treat, I've treated patients who their other doctors said, we have to move your toes because of diabetes. <clears throat> we treated them with, you know, the comfrey and the salves and things of that nature soaking in that. And we've seen a toe that was, for example, black become pink again. Okay, so this can happen. All right, these are the simplest things that you can do. All right, and they're also some of the most powerful ones. Okay, I hope that helps. Uh, I'm open to anybody if you have any questions. Um, be happy to try to help you with. We still got a few minutes left. And uh, anything you got, please let me know. You got anything yet going? Not yet. Okay. So we'll give you a couple minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, um, I'm also very open to suggestions. What other types of workshops would you like to see? They can be natural medicine workshops. They can be, uh, uh, like I said, herb walks. They can be how to, uh, uh, emergency first aid that we can do natural first aid. And they can be on other things. They can be on any uh, elven subject that we've talked about, on meditation or spirituality, uh, elven life coaching. They can be on Reiki, uh, you name it, let me know. And uh, we're happy to go ahead and do a workshop on that. Our goal is for you to learn how to take care of yourself and how to reawaken a special elven life that exists within each and every one of us. There's a few questions. Okay, go ahead, what's the first? Uh, first off, Samantha. Is talking about your first aid book. So if anybody wants to see the first, you know. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> the first aid books. Okay. 
Okay, this sounds like a sales pitch. <laughs> so let's do it and let's get it over with. I have written uh, about six different books on on holistic first on holistic care on a wide variety of things. The one that I was just asked about was on holistic first aid. All right, this one you can find even though I am the only scholar. I'm all obviously known in the professional industry as Dr. Aaron Spendalalis. I am a naturopathic doctor. I've been in practice for over 20 years and I've learned that for those that really understand what the word doctor means, it, it, it doesn't mean healer. Okay, the actual word comes from Latin and ancient Greek and it meant teacher. While we are supposed to treat our patients, we're supposed to, above all else, to teach them how to take care of themselves. And so we've been running a medical clinic here for quite a number of years here in California. And I hope to always be the kind of doctor that is in contact with patients and treats them. But I've learned also that even more important than that is to teach them to care for themselves. So I wrote a series of books, and the one that I was just asked about here is on holistic first aid. Everything we've discussed here today, along with a whole lot of other things, is described in this book. And you can find it on Amazon by just looking at holistic first aid, Dr. Arundel Spindalalis. And if you'd like, I'll put a link for that in the description. I wasn't going to, but if you'd like to, I'm happy to do that so you can find it. So we have that book out there. We actually have quite a number of series. Um, for those of who don't know, I am a, uh, a vegan doctor. I'm actually a raw vegan. been a raw vegan for quite a number of years. So I wrote a book on curing chronic disease with a raw vegan diet. But also there's a few others. Uh, and then there is the holistic approach to Lyme disease. I'm one of the only Lyme literate doctors in this part of California. Lyme disease is a raging disease, but it can be cured. Don't ever let anybody tell you otherwise. And then we have others about what it was like to run a naturopathic medical center. All right. And case histories. These are real case histories of what we did. And a complete body repair, how to treat a lot of the root causes of diseases, such as candida, heavy metal poisoning, and parasites. And uh, four of those books are actually all included, included in one single book. And this is the Handbook of Holistic Healing. And uh, four of those books are all included in one book. So you can do that. They're available both as ebook and as, um, as a paperback. All right. So I hope that answered that question. What else you got? Okay. Let's see. Um, Samantha wants to know if um, plastic or glass is better for the herbs. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful question. We're pretty anti-plastic if we can help it. We prefer glass for, as you can see, about everything we have is glass. Uh, plastic, there are types of plastic that's not so bad, but plastic still does, still does leach chemicals into the, um, into the medium, into the alcohol, especially if it's alcohol, it will leach chemicals out of the plastic. And a lot of plastic has something called uh, estrogen um, analogs which means they behave just like estrogen in the body, and which is, a, which is a very bad thing, all right? It's like taking a dose of estrogen, synthetic estrogen, and you shouldn't be doing that. Plus, plastic gets microfractures in them. And what's, what lives inside of microfractures? Bacteria. So you can end up um, contaminating your wonderful medication that you just went out and made or the teas that you make, all right? Glass, 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 plastic, very bad. What else you got? Okay, uh, let's see. And thank you for that great, great question. Um, and instead of oak bark, can another astringent be used, like witch hazel or oh, laurel? Outstanding. Absolutely. So the question was, can you use something other than oak bark? Oak bark is our favorite, but absolutely correct. A wonderful astringent, and it will work, is uh, witch hazel. Again, outstanding astringent. So, yeah, there are many, many astringents out there. That's just the one that happened to work that day and the one we had on hand at the time. But yeah, great. There are many, many other astringents and um, uh, walnut bark works, you know, from the, the hulls. Uh, but witch hazel's amazing. Great question. Great question. Okay. What is the botanical name for golden seal? Okay. The botanical name for golden seal is hydrastis canadensis. All right. 
I'm just this wealth of knowledge. No. <laughs> years and years of study. So hydrastis hydrast canadensis. All right. And uh, again, it's stupidly expensive. It really is dumb. It, it's, um, it has become harder to find, and therefore they've racked the price way up. We try to keep it even still for us is expensive, but we try to keep it less expensive for our patients and for people who want to pick it up for us who are non-patients as well, because we've allowed non-patients to use the online store as well. So it's, it's available from us. Um, it's a whole lot cheaper. It's probably half the price, because what is it with us? About 60? Golden Seal, about 60, 70. Yeah, 60, 75. Yeah, it's about 60, 75 dollars a pound with us, and that's still, and that's about as cheap as we can uh, sell it to our patients or to those who want to get it. In most places, it's double that price. Well, 100, 120 dollars a pound. Ridiculous. It's it's mostly greed, though it is hard harder to find now. What else you got? Um, they wanted to know that. Could you keep the tinctures and sacks in the car for emergency, or does it get too hot? Okay. Okay. Well, there's a payoff. You can keep them in the car, but they won't last very long, especially in the summertime. Once, I mean, any time other than the summer, depending on your environment where you're at, it's probably going to be okay. But once summer comes, if your car gets hot, you're going to destroy them, and they'll be destroyed literally within weeks. Uh, it won't take very long. So we recommend that if you want to carry them around, do like the lady did when she discovered about the hemorrhoids. Keep it in your purse if you want to or, or your carry bag, whatever you do. But keeping it in the car in the summer, they're going to go bad real fast, real, real fast. They will because it's for the saps, they're in oil. The oil will go rancid. And for the tincture, even though it's alcohol based, it will get too hot and will destroy the medical properties of the herbs that are in the tincture. Good question. Okay. Next question. Okay. Uh, a wilderness workshop maybe oh wow that's a great idea a wilderness workshop um, that would be awesome I would love to do that um, what I would do in something like that is we can we can combine and do an herb walk uh, and I would be happy to at the time throw in survival skills um, survival skills go way 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 back and I would be um, happy to do that uh, sometime. I think that was a great idea. And we live on 150 acres up here. And so uh, we can do that and we can go down to the stream. We have a swimming hole here. Uh, we have boulders and rocks to climb on. So those would be great examples of me showing you some of the safety tips and how to survive and how to, well, it was workshop, how to deal with water that's suspect, how to work with water that you think maybe has uh, bacteria or amoebas or things in it, how you can make it safe. So I think that was a great idea. I would be happy to do that. Uh, that's some of my favorite stuff I like to do. So very good, we can do that. Okay, and you can tell the ones that actually said that they loved your books. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. The books are a passion of mine. Thank you very much for everybody that said that. Um, the books mean a lot to me because I can touch one patient today and treat one issue or a thousand people can read my books in the same day and touch a whole lot more lives. On the note of books, it'll be about two more weeks. I am almost done. I'm down to the last chapter and uh, final drafting. These are all holistic books on holistic first aid, holistic healing, all this type of things. I have a new book coming out called Elven Awakenings, and it is my first elven book. It is basically the handbook of being an elf in the modern world how to reawaken and how to live your life as an elf or some advice on how to do that. It's, uh, it's over 200 pages of advice on history of the elves, on elven healing, on elven manifestation, uh, and uh, storytelling and loves of uh, things that elves love, poetry. It's a pretty extensive book covering basically a handbook of being an elf in the modern world. So that'll be out in about two weeks. Uh, these are all on Amazon. That one will be on Amazon as well. Uh, we'll make a, an alert letting everybody know post it'll be out. Only the byline on that one instead of Dr. Erin Spindaleos, it'll be uh, Elven Awakenings by the Elven Scholar. So that'll be out in a couple of weeks. I hope you enjoy it. And again, all of our books in order to help people out, we keep them discounted extensively. And even the Elven book will also be available as an ebook uh, or a paperback. It's up to you. 
all right, so that we make sure everyone has access to it. Okay, is that it? Ask if there's any more questions in case I'm... Okay, are there any more questions before we hang up here? It's been just over an hour. Um, if not, I very much enjoyed doing this with you. I look forward to doing more workshops. We want to teach. We want you to learn. Uh, come up with more ideas. These were great ideas today, and we'd love to do more of those in the future. Um, other than that, take a look at the school. Um, I also, just for your information, I will be producing another in the Elvin Love series uh, of videos. I'll be producing one in the next couple of days on, because of what people are going through nowadays on Elvin Love and healing of anxiety and depression. All right, I have, uh, as a doctor, I have treated anxiety and depression for over 20 years, and my preference is to always treat it naturally. And in this case, we put an Elvin perspective on that. So in a day or two, I will be posting a video on my YouTube channel on how we treat uh, anxiety and depression within today's world of COVID and everything else going on. All right, is that it? That's it, they're all saying thank you. Uh, and thank you to everyone and all of you have a most blessed rest of the day. Thank you for this gift of letting me be able to do this. All right, all of you have a most blessed day. Namadie.